This is my fourth video in my AP Biology review series, and it is about the cell. How we study cells. Electron microscopes, specifically scanning electron microscopes, which show detailed surface images, and transmission electron microscopes, which show a thin section of the specimen. Here is an image from a scanning electron microscope. You can see the surface of the red blood cells very well. And here is an image from a transmission electron microscope. And you can see it's like a cross section of the cell. Ultracentrifuge. The cells are put into a blender and cut up to be a mix. This mix is then put into an ultracentrifuge, which is basically a device that spins them very quickly. And this allows scientists to separate cell organelles by size in order to study them. So as you can see in this image, they start with a mix of all the organelles of different sizes. And then after being spun for a certain amount of time at a certain speed, we have the heaviest organelles fall to the bottom. And then those can be removed and studied. And then the rest of the mixture gets poured into the next test tube and the process continues. The heaviest um, pieces fall to the bottom and can be removed until everything is sorted by size. All cells have cytoplasm, ribosomes, DNA, and a plasma membrane. Prokaryotes are in two domains, bacteria and archaea. And they have, those two domains have a few differences. All prokaryotes are single-celled organisms, the oldest life, and it's very important that they don't have a nucleus or other membrane-bound organelles. This is one of the big things that um, makes them different from eukaryotes. So instead of a nucleus, they have a nucleoid, which is a region where the cell's DNA is. Pili, used for attachment, and they're only in some prokaryotes. As you can see, they're like the, the hair-like structures in that picture. Flagella, used for motion, and they're also in some animal cells, and that's the tail-like structure. On the side, you can see a picture of a prokaryote. Eukaryotes, are in four domains, animalia, plantae, fungi, and protista. They have membrane-bound organelles such as nuclei, mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, and many more that we'll talk about throughout the video. And they evolved from prokaryotes, so they're more complex life. And here's a picture of a eukaryote, and we'll talk about the parts of a eukaryote shortly. Animal versus plant cells. These two are pretty similar in many ways, but also have several important differences. Again, both plant and animal cells are eukaryotes, so they're going to have a lot of the same things, such as a nucleus, um, a cytoplasm with mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, all of that. Um, a few differences include plant cells have a cell wall, in addition to a plasma membrane, which gives it more structure, while animal cell only has a plasma membrane. The vacuoles are different. Animal cells have one or more small vacuoles. Plant cells have really large vacuole. You can see it in the picture. It makes up a lot of the cell. And plant cells are going to have chloroplasts, which animal cells will not. And we'll talk about those in the future. Let's start with the nucleus and the nucleolus. The nucleus is, has DNA coiled into chromatin, and the nuclear membrane has pores. And this is important because it's selectively permeable, chooses what can come in or go out. The nucleolus is inside the nucleus. This is where ribosomal RNA is made. So that codes for the ribosome parts. And this is also where the subunits of the ribosome are made. 
And here's a picture of the nucleus. You can see the nucleolus inside of it and the, nucle the nuclear pores, which are important for transportation um, of materials. And again, chromatin is the tightly coiled DNA that you can see there. Ribosomes are where proteins are made. They have two main locations and where they are affects what they do. So if they're in the cytoplasm, they're called free ribosomes, and these will normally make proteins that will be used inside the cell. If they're on the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum, they're called bound or ribosomes and will usually make proteins that will be secreted out of the cell or become a part of the cell membrane. Here's a picture of ribosomes that are bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. You might recognize that this is an image take, taken with a transmission electron microscope because it looks like a cross section. And just want to remind you that ribosomes are going to be in eukaryotes and in prokaryotes. And you can see how those would be in the picture. Those blue dots are ribosomes, free ribosomes, because they're floating around in the cytoplasm. Endoplasmic reticulum. There's smooth ER. So ER just stands for endoplasmic reticulum. And this is where lipids are synthesized. It also detoxifies drugs and poisons, and it stores calcium ions, and that is very important for muscle contraction. The rough ER is the site of protein synthesis, and it's called rough because, as you can see in the picture, there's a lot of ribosomes right next to it, all around it. Um, so I guess it gives the appearance of being rough. And the protein will go from here to the Golgi body. And as you can see in the picture, smooth ER and rough ER are connected, but do have different structure and function. The Golgi body is, is basically a shipping center. It modifies the protein that came from the ER, so the endoplasmic reticulum, and sends it out in a vesicle. So as you can see in the picture, there's a cis face, and that's where the protein is received from the endoplasmic reticulum in a vesicle. So as you can see, incoming transport vesicle. Transphase packages the protein to be sent out in a vesicle. So you can see why some people might call it a shipping center because it receives quote unquote packages and ships them out. Lysosomes are full of hydrolytic enzymes. They perform phagocytosis, which is where a food vacuole will fuse with a lysosome and digest the materials taken in to the cell and those materials will be recycled. Auto autophagy is where it digests organelles that are damaged. So materials will be recycled. Organelles that no longer function will basically be eaten up by these lysosomes. And as you can see in this picture, um, lysosomes, there's a food particle that will get eaten and take it in by the cell through phagocytosis, and then the food vacuole will fuse with the lysosome, as you can see. And then the lysosome will use its enzymes to break that food apart, and later there will be exocytosis, elimination of things it doesn't need. Vacuoles. Food vacuoles are formed through phagocytosis, and we talked about that in the last slide, if you remember. Central vacuoles are in mature plant cells, and they're very important for the storage of nutrients, pigments, ions, and for the plant's structure. Contractile vacuoles pump excess water out of the cell. They're in 
freshwater protists, such as paramecia, which is a common example for this. Here you can see a paramecium, and there is an arrow in the paramecium pointing to the contractile vacuole, and this lives in fresh water. Um, so a lot of water will come in to it, and we'll talk about um, hypotonic and hypertonic solutions in our next video, and that's why the water comes in. So it's very important that it has a contractile vacuole to pump that water out. And then here in the corner, you can see a plant cell, and you can see how big that central vacuole of a plant is. It makes up a huge part of the cell. Mitochondria and chloroplasts. Mitochondria are where cellular respiration takes place. It generates ATP through breaking down sugars. The cristae are the foldings of the inner membrane. The mitochondrial matrix is the inside portion of the second membrane. So as you can see, the cristes, the foldings. Um, mitochondria are in both plant cells and animal cells. Chloroplasts are only in plants. It's where photosynthesis takes place. They use solar energy to power the synthesis of sugars. They have thylakoid, which is a flat membranous system, and the stack forms a granum. Stroma is the fluid outside of the thylakoids, and there's a picture of chloroplast. And we'll talk a lot more about cellular respiration and photosynthesis in future videos. So the reason I grouped these two together is because they do energy um, processes and because of the theory of endosymbiosis, which is that mitochondria and chloroplasts used to be prokaryotes that lived on their own, but they were engulfed by larger eukaryotes. And then they had a symbiotic relationship, which means that they both benefited, both the prokaryote and the eukaryote. The larger cell, the eukaryote, benefited from the energy that these prokaryotes helped generate. And the prokaryotes got a safe place to say there would be no um, predators and nutrients from the cell. Some evidence, mitochondria and chloroplasts, each have their own ribosomes, DNA, and protein synthesis abilities. So here the picture of the two, you can see that they both have ribosomes, and these are their own ribosomes, as well as their own DNA. Last we have the cytoskeleton, which is a complete, net, uh, sorry, complex network of protein fibers, and it provides structure for cells and it allows for movement. So motor proteins will attach onto these fibers to move organelles, such as vesicles. And the main types of fibers are microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. And here's a picture with the three. And here at the top where it says actin filament, it's called that because it's made of actin, but they're also called microfilaments. And that's it for this video. I'll be talking more about the plasma membrane in the next video because I think that's a really important and longer um, organelle to talk about. Thank you for watching and please subscribe if you would like to see more videos.